The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is a show about sidekicks, the people who stand behind the great men and the icons and often end up forgotten. Living in the shadow of a hero isn't easy, and sometimes people find themselves getting crushed under the heel of the great men the world idolizes. This is a common theme throughout the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Playboy millionaire Tony Stark has to come to terms with the devastating consequences his job as an arms dealer has in Avengers Civil War. Similarly, a regular working man turns supervillain in Spider-Man Homecoming after the government leaves him powerless and jobless. The moral ambiguity of superhero work in the 21st century is often in display in these movies, but no movie does a better job at asking the cutting political questions that the Falcon and the Winter Soldier does. Taking place after The Blip, which was the disappearance and then reappearance of half of all life on Earth, the show explores the bits and pieces the movies only glossed over. In this video, we'll be referring to the first half of The Blip as The Snap to avoid confusion, and of course, spoilers for everything Marvel. After The Snap, Earth was war-torn and defeated, but despite this, it seemingly entered a state of peace and unity. Humans largely came together to rebuild, and borders and nation-states went unenforced. The blip, meanwhile, brought with it the return of the status quo, with governments quickly seeking to re-establish themselves and police forces and paramilitaries evicting millions from their newly acquired homes. It seems like post-snap, parts of the world entered into a state known as disaster socialism. And I'm not soapboxing here, this is a common phenomenon seen in areas struck by natural disasters like hurricanes or man-made disasters like war, where people come together on a give what you can and take what you need basis. Which in post-apocalyptic media is pretty rare. Usually you see things like The Walking Dead, where society devolves into disaster fascism, a state characterized by brutal warlords vying for control over the remnants of society. So that's a nice breath of fresh air. And when you look at it sociologically, it makes sense. You can generally divide society into two pieces, base and superstructure. I'll cover my face. Base <laughs> and superstructure. The base of society is the mode of production, so it's all the essential bits and pieces humanity needs to survive and reproduce. You know, how is food made, how are goods created, what is the family structure of your society? These things change a lot over time. Technology changes, the position of laborers change, family units are a lot smaller and tighter than they once were. You get the idea. All these changes to the base functioning of society influence the superstructure, which are societies, cultures, institutions, political structures, rituals, governments, etc, etc, basically everything else. Both base and superstructure influence each other, but the base being the base, it is the most dominant. In 2018, when Thanos wiped away half of all life on the planet, that was a sweeping blow to the base of society. Who works the factories and farms? How do things get transported to people? How does society continue to reproduce itself when we just lost over 3 billion people? And so the superstructure of society saw an unimaginable change as well. States and governments were unable to reproduce themselves because borders and property rights weren't enforceable in any meaningful way. Unfortunately, we don't get a lot of information of what post-snap society looked like. But if Carly Morgenthau, the show's main villain, is to be believed, humanity survived because everyone helped each other, echoing Marx's famous quote, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. This suggests that class might have been relegated to pre-snap society, which is pretty huge. So once Iron Man does the blip and dies, I don't know how I misremembered, but Iron Man doesn't do the blip, it was Hulk. Uh, yeah, my bad. You're taking a vaguely socialistic society, adding 3.5 billion people to it, all of whom need clothes, homes, food, and only know life in a pre-snap society, and want a return to that world structure they're used to. This is what we call a contradiction. So what do we get post-blip? Mass displacement leading to the creation of refugees, homelessness, and presumably all the maladies we're used to today like inequality and poverty. This contradiction naturally creates the conditions for social unrest that lead to the rise of the Flag Smashers. We get introduced to them in the first episode of the series through their infamous slogan, One World, One People. 
They use an app to communicate with their members and have a vast network of supporters. Carly Morgenthau emerges as their de facto leader, along with the rest of the core group that took an imitation super soldier serum to become superhuman. Sam Wilson, or the Falcon, first learns of them while on a mission as an agent for the Air Force. He's conducting an anti-terrorist stop in Tunisia, and they need to stop the bad guys before they enter Libyan airspace because, being US military, they can't legally enter the country. Which raises the question, is the United States militarily involved in Libya? Did the Libyan Civil War happen in the Marvel Universe? The inclusion of Libya is curious, because regardless of what the canon status of US-Libyan foreign relations are in the show, it's a reminder that even post-Blip, the United States is deeply involved in its controversial military incursions in the Middle East, and our favorite superheroes are involved in that project in one way or another. So I actually just found out that Sam Wilson served two terms in Afghanistan. And I don't mean to demean or degrade anyone who served in the military, but it does make the connection between superheroes and the war on terror a little more explicit. Sam's character arc revolves around the contradiction between being a US agent and being black. His character debuted in the 2014 film Captain America The Winter Soldier, only months after the Black Lives Matter movement erupted in protest after the murder of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. Despite the social unrest, 2014 was a different time in the United States, and race didn't factor in at all in Sam's character in The Winter Soldier, or any movies following it. It wasn't until the 2020 summer uprisings that Black Lives Matter pierced into the mainstream popularity, fundamentally shifting the way race, police brutality, and the criminal justice system is portrayed in our media. So while 2014 Sam was just the Falcon, 2021 Sam had to be the Black Falcon. Shortly after the Air Force mission, Sam returns home to see his sister Sarah. She's struggling to keep her restaurant afloat and is considering selling off the boat their parents inherited to them after they passed away, a decision that Sam strongly disagrees with. It's in this moment that the show takes a very interesting choice. In this world, despite being superheroes, Sam, Bucky, and the rest of the crew have to earn a living like regular ass people. Contrast this with a show like The Boys that grapples with the ramifications of superheroism in a world obsessed with money and fame, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier just refuse to acknowledge that reality. Sure, Sam and Bucky are famous, but they don't see any of the benefits that come with that. When Sam and Sarah go and apply for a business loan, the agent is excited to see The Falcon, sure, but he denies the loan anyway. The heroes are normal working people. Just like you! And it's a weird decision to just ignore the natural industry that would form around superheroes and the wealth and privilege they would inevitably enjoy in the real world. In a show where a man with wings and a man with a metal arm fight another man in an American flag costume, this is the most fantastical bit for me but it's a deliberate choice by the writers. Later on, they're going to be making a whole lot of commentary on race, justice, and equality that just wouldn't work coming from millionaire Sam Wilson. So the Wilsons are having money problems and Sam doesn't want to inherit the mantle of Captain America. He then wants it even less when Bucky introduces him to the black super soldier Isaiah Bradley. Isaiah was experimented on by the US government around the same time Steve Rogers became Captain America. Both men went behind enemy lines to save their fellow soldiers, but while Steve was awarded and made a global icon of patriotism, the existence of Isaiah was hidden in an effort to conceal the government's crimes. Soon after leaving Isaiah's house, the duo are stopped by two cops who presume Sam to be harassing Bucky. Which, I mean, I get it, they're trying to do a little racist cop thing, but it's like a little too much for me. Like, am I watching a Marvel show or am I watching Crash, you know? As icing on the racism cake, Sam is wronged even more when, after donating the shield to the Smithsonian as a piece of history, the US government takes it, gives it to someone else, and dons them the new Captain America. The first few episodes of the show are just Sam getting increasingly disillusioned with his country, and his disillusionment mirrors the radicalization of Carly Morgenthau. 
an impoverished refugee turned super soldier, Carly is shown time and time again to have the moral high ground. The Flag Smashers are hidden and protected by the people because they are the people, and they're engaged in a soft guerrilla war against the Global Repatriation Council. An international organization founded after the blip, the GRC are tasked with dealing with the mass displacement and refugee crisis, and they're not doing a very good job. According to the Flag Smashers, their poor stewardship has only worsened the situation. In one episode, the group steals six months worth of supplies from a GRC warehouse that they allege was being misused. In another, they steal vaccines to give to the poor, with these acts giving Carly the nickname of Robin Hood among the people of Central Europe. As the show progresses, the GRC is preparing to vote on the Patch Act, a piece of legislation that would evict millions of people from homes they acquired before the blip. Imagine being disintegrated and then reappearing five years later and your family home is being occupied by the homeless guy who used to live down the street. It's not very fair, right? But also, now imagine you're that guy and you've been living somewhere for five years and uh-oh, now you have to be evicted. The whole situation's kind of a mess and this is the bind the GRC find themselves in. Whose rights between these two groups do they uphold? The pre-snap owners or the post-snap squatters? The show makes a really big deal out of this political question, but once you stop to think about it, it's pretty simple. Just build more homes. I think after dealing with fucking Thanos, you could have the political capital <laughs> to build more homes for people. <laughs> it's so fucking silly. You put people in the homes they used to own before the snap, and whoever has to move gets a new home. Or at least an apartment somewhere, I don't know. But the problem isn't that the GRC is having to choose what to do between two diametrically opposed groups. The previous owners and the new squatters aren't opposed at all. They just want somewhere to live. No, as a big international organization, they have to factor the interests of hundreds of groups, from governments to property developers to homeowners and other moneyed interests. And the reason they can't just solve the issue like any reasonable person would is that in this instance, there is a very powerful lobby against building homes for everyone. Maybe this is beyond the political scope of this video, but if there's a housing market where people make a profit off of selling houses, then there's going to be a very powerful interest group lobbying to keep housing scarce. Another example of this is the real life COVID crisis. While yes, it may seem like gross institutional incompetence, there are perfectly valid and rational reasons our institutions act the way they do. The GRC are almost institutionally designed to be unable to deal with major societal contradictions like this. And so Carly and her friends believe they need a revolution to achieve justice. While her struggle against the GRC heightens, the show takes special interest in using Baron Zemo as a political mouthpiece. The duo help him escape prison and use him to continue tracking down the Flag Smashers. Zemo's philosophy revolves around being anti-supremacist, likening the drive to be superhuman to the goal of a certain well-known World War II leader. And while it's an interesting connection and it makes for a good one-liner, it lacks substance. Presumably, Zemo is anti-super soldier because it provides certain people with power over others, creating a hierarchy that's ripe for abuse. His villain origin story is literally about his family being killed because of a conflict started by the Avengers. So he definitely has a reason. But Zemo is a literal baron. He won the genetic lottery and was born into an aristocratic bloodline. If that isn't an example of supremacy, I don't know what is. It's an interesting thought that's brought up in the show and I hope it gets explored in later Marvel productions but it just ends up being a confusing political distraction from the show's main message. So, okay, the show sets up all these actors with different philosophies, and finally, Sam Wilson gets the jump on Carly. But seeing as they're both pretty down on the status quo, he wants to talk her out of her revolution. The new Captain America and his sidekick, Lamar Hoskins, or Battlestar, are itching to start the fight and jump in to stop their discussion before they reach a conclusion. In the ensuing battle, Battlestar gets killed by Carly, and in a super soldier serum infused rage, Cap hulks out and kills a Flag Smasher in front of a crowd who record the whole thing. The title of the episode is aptly named, The Whole World Is Watching. 
After getting put down by Sam and Bucky, the new Cap is sent to military court to answer for his wrongdoings. Like with the Wilsons' shaky economics, the show asks us to suspend our disbelief as Cap is stripped of his title and military benefits for killing a foreign national. Now, I don't know what international politics looks like in Marvel's universe, but in the real world, the United States operates with very little international oversight. And the Flag Smashers are terrorists. If this was real life, he'd be more likely to be commended than to be disciplined. Shit, it might make him more popular, even Derek Chauvin has supporters. And people loved Barack Obama after he took out Osama. Taking out someone who was involved in the murder of Battlestar? I mean, that's not much of a negative to a whole lot of people. I suppose the cameras record the man with his hands up, so I can kind of see it. But have you seen how much it takes to acquit a police officer in this country? But it doesn't matter what would happen in real life, in the show it is taken seriously. And again, it's really because the show is going to make a lot of commentary on justice that wouldn't work if Captain America could just go around and kill a bunch of terrorists. By most American standards, Captain America isn't doing anything morally wrong in killing an enemy combatant. But in terms of optics, it doesn't look very heroic and looks speak a lot louder in Marvel's universe than substance does. The show does introduce an interesting element of sociological storytelling during his trial. I only ever did what you asked of me, what you told me to be and trained me to do, and I did it, and I did it well. What he meant by this isn't explained, but it can be interpreted as this being the culmination of not only all the pressure he was under as Captain America, but as the inevitable endpoint of his military mission. He was a product of his environment, and as we'll come to learn, so was Carly. It's finally the day to vote on the Patch Act, and the Flag Smashers are staging an attack to stop them. Cue a bunch of poorly lit action scenes leading to the final confrontation between Sam and Carly. Again, they argue philosophically, Sam's trying to convince her there's another way to achieve justice, but unfortunately, the show isn't interested in a battle of wits. Just like how Killmonger has to kill innocent women to prevent you from sympathizing with his mission, Carly has lost the plot. Being so radicalized, even her team are wary of her. By this point, she's already killed a bunch of innocent people, not necessarily because of her political ideology, but seemingly because of her flawed leadership and personal flaws. By the end, she's senselessly beating on Sam, who refuses to fight her. She ends up getting killed by another character who, uh, if, if you don't want this video to be an hour long, <laughs> we should just not talk about her. And then Sam carries her body out of the building to a crowd of onlookers as he prepares to give a speech laying out everything he's learned so far. This is it. This is the political conclusion of our series. So what's our thesis? Sam meets with a terrified GRC representative, scolding them. Carly, just like Cap, was a manifestation of her environment. An outburst of the raw contradiction society was facing. And he's right. If the injustice continues, it won't just be a small group of people rebelling. It will be thousands. You might have noticed in the footage that by now he's donning the red, white, and blue. He segues this discussion about Carly by talking about how he's just a regular guy who wants to do the right thing. He's grappled with the innumerable, the unquantifiable atrocities his country has committed against black America but his people have bled for this country, and he's not going to give it up without a fight. That's why he chose to take the shield, because he's just a man who refuses to give up. His speech is successful, and the GRC suspends the vote indefinitely as they try to find a different way to help all those in need. This is the thesis of the show. It's a marriage of social progressivism and American patriotism. His speech harkens back to the progressive era of politics where patriotism and progressivism were one. It's hard to see from our vantage point in 2021 or whenever you're watching this video, but back in 1912, all three presidential candidates ran as progressives. After political projects like the New Deal, American nationalism and patriotism were inseparable from the social programs Americans benefited from. In the show, the stream of thought gains a voice through the Falcon after a failed revolution. In real life, progressivism became the status quo as policymakers and leaders feared a communist takeover of the country. 
Sam's quote that if things don't change, the next Carly Morgenthau will be worse mirrors the thinking that fueled the welfare state of the previous century. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the Flag Smashers appear to hail from Central or Eastern Europe. Sam has witnessed the Marvel version of the Red Menace, and knows it's time that the people are dealt a new hand. As they say, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Black Americans, along with other minority groups, weren't considered part of the American project of prosperity. As a result, laws like the New Deal were specifically crafted to keep them from benefiting. Sam's vision of America is one that considers all races equally. After all is said and done, he dedicates a piece of the Smithsonian to Isaiah Bradley's story. While it may not absolve the sins of his country, it does take a step into expanding who was offered the dignity of being American under the leadership of the new Captain America. Now you can't talk about this without bringing up the elephant in the room. Marvel's involvement with the US military. A large part of Marvel's filmography is done with the participation of the United States military. They provide funding and access to military equipment in exchange for some control over the final project. This is why if the villain is someone that's in the US military, it's either part of a fictitious branch of the military, like sword or shield, or it's someone in the military and they're like very obviously bad, and then there's other people in the military that fight against them and ultimately win. WandaVision had a pretty obvious FBI connection and even included a special thanks to the Department of Defense in its end credits, revealing their involvement in the series. While I don't know if this production had the involvement of the DoD, its patriotic message sounds like the exact thing they could sign off on. Maybe the show is too blunt with its criticisms of the government for the DoD's comfort, but in its acknowledgement of those blunders, it still reinforces support for the government. In the show, Captain America is canonically a propaganda tool for the military, so I'm always wary when the movies get the DoD stamp of approval. And it's always worth asking, if history rhymes, we've been here before. A hundred years ago, progressives won, and well specifically white progressives, but they won and 50 years later, they were overcome by a neoliberal revolution. Is a multiracial big tent progressive coalition the key to prevent that from happening again? Or are we just starting the long Sisyphean trek up the mountainside before the boulder inevitably slides back down again? Is this the way forward? Or should we stop pushing the boulder and think about another way to achieve justice? mythology, religion, and spiritualism have often been used as justifying ideologies for the exploits of rulers and tyrants in the mortal realm. So where does that leave the legend of Korra? 